Hello everyone and welcome to my talk on web scraping tech stack in 2020. The internet has changed a lot in the past few years and so did web scraping. Extracting web data at scale is becoming increasingly difficult. Web applications are complex, dynamic, and often employ several layers of protection against automated access. This talk will not give you a cookie cutter strategy to scrape any website, but it will show you the latest tools and technology that will significantly improve your chances of creating reliable and scalable scrapers. My name is Ondra Urban, and I'm the lead maintainer of Epify SDK, which, according to GitHub, is the most popular web scraping library for JavaScript. Epify is a web scraping and automation platform, and we scrape billions of pages every month for small businesses and Fortune 500 companies. Besides leading a team of engineers, I'm also an architect of our enterprise-grade scraping solutions. Before we start, let me ask you a question. What is web scraping? When you search on Google for web scraping tutorial, most of the results will teach you how to download HTML and extract information from it. It works, but hardly scratches the surface. It's like making a microwave-ready meal and calling it cooking. Technically, it's correct, but it gives you the wrong impression of what cooking actually is. Do you know Hacker News? It's a popular technology news site, and only a few days ago, People there were discussing web scraping. What do you think they talked about the most? Which tool they used to parse HTML? In our experience, HTML parsing is only a small part of the web scraping problem, both in terms of complexity and the time consumption. So what are the hard parts? Downloading a thousand pages a day instead of 10, and then a million instead of a thousand. Keeping your scrapers reliable and up to date any website update can potentially break your scraper. You also have to overcome clever anti-scraping systems, guarantee perfect quality of data, and last but not least, you must be able to do all of this at a price that is acceptable for both you and your client. Okay, enough talk. Let's finally scrape something. The obvious thing to do first is to download the page's HTML. Let's look at how we might do that. Sure. We can make a simple HTTP request to fetch the page's HTML, right? We tried that for Amazon.com and surprise, it did not work. To discuss automated access to Amazon data, please, blah, 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 we got blocked on our first request. Why? Because Amazon and most of the other major internet players use request header analysis to detect automated traffic. What can we do now? Well, we can add the correct headers for Amazon Adding the user agent header will be enough to get you going, but other websites are much stricter in their checks. Some check for specific header values, others enforce correct character casing. Fortunately, there is a simple way to avoid all those problems, and that is emulation of browser headers. The purpose of all bot detection software is to block bots, but at the same time, humans must not be blocked. Emulation of browser headers from a publicly used browser, such as Chrome or Firefox, allows us to disguise our scrapers as human users. There's one very important detail, though. Never mix up the headers. There are tiny differences between headers used by different browsers and their versions. To have the best disguise, find the set of headers used by a specific browser version and use all of those together. Now that we know how to fetch a page's HTML, we can start crawling. Crawling, or spidering, is the process of collecting links from websites and it has challenges of its own. Before we start collecting links, we need a place to store them. This is easy for short-lived crawls, but once you need to crawl millions of pages, you'll save yourself a lot of headache if you use a proper request queue. Here are the four key features that it must have to serve a wide variety of scraping scenarios. First, it needs to be dynamic. You need to be able to add and remove requests from the queue as you open pages and find more links. Second, it needs to make sure that the links are unique and not just equal, but pointing to the same resource. This means it needs to normalize the URLs by reordering parameters, removing fragments, and so on. Third, it must be persistent. You don't want to lose your progress in a long crawl when your crawler suddenly crashes. And finally, you must be able to store extra information with the URLs, such as login credentials, crawling state, and partial results. Okay, great. We have a place to store our links. 
Let's look at collecting them. On one hand, collecting links is a pretty boring process, so you want to automate as much as you can. On the other hand, you can't just grab everything the internet throws at you. The best way to go about this is to use the structure of the website to guide you. Are you looking for product links? Find the product elements and only grab links from those. Do you want to do a full domain crawl? OK, find all links, but limit them to the domain you're interested in. A good tool will let you easily apply those filters and will deal with the extraction itself for you. Could this tool also enforce uniqueness of the links? Yes, but no. To ensure reliability and consistency, it would need to keep a cache of links it already found, essentially its own mini request queue. There is one pretty big challenge in finding links though. Most websites still use HTML href attributes for navigation, but the number of JavaScript links is quickly increasing. What is a JavaScript link? Typically a link that is created dynamically once a user clicks a button. Why is that a problem? Because you can't really parse this link from HTML. It's not there. To get the link, you need to simulate a user clicking the button. And for that, you need a JavaScript rendering engine. I'm sure you notice that sometimes a website works correctly in one browser and not in the other. That's mostly because of differences in their rendering engines. Long story short, to reliably extract JavaScript links, you need a browser. This brings yet another host of challenges though. Clicking 100 times a second in a web page to extract links is not something browsers and websites were made for, and they need a bit of convincing to do that. We've covered the basics of scraping and crawling. The previous concepts give you a great baseline for extracting data from the internet. For personal and small projects, you probably don't need much more. But if you want to learn how to scale your project from a thousand pages to a million without a major headache, bear with me. Okay, so the first and most important aspect of scraping at scale is using the right set of tools. Yes, you can find a library to do your HTTP requests, an HTML parser, put all your URLs in an array and write a for loop to iterate over them. Yeah, sure. But what about errors? A network error or a parsing error should not crash your scraper. So you implement a retry system. Then you find out you need to scrape faster and you add parallelization. But then your scraper runs out of memory, crashes, and you need to start scraping from the beginning. So you add a database to manage your requests. Slowly but surely, you implement everything we talked about so far and you spend 90% of your time solving generic problems instead of focusing on the data you need. It does not matter if you prefer JavaScript or Python. Always use a good scraping library like Epify SDK or Scrapey. It will save you tons of work and stress. Okay, so we have our great, fast, reliable scraper. We have millions of links to crawl and after a hundred or so, our website sends us nothing but rate limit or authorization errors. It's time to use a proxy server to split the load over many IP addresses. This is pretty obvious to those familiar with web scraping. What people often don't realize is how many different proxy servers there are and how to best utilize them. The most basic proxy server is a data center proxy. They are cheap, fast, reliable, and the easiest to detect. The exact opposite are residential proxies. Leveraging real users' devices and a huge range of IP addresses, they are very hard to detect. On the other hand, residential proxies are very expensive, often slow and unreliable, because the user can lose internet connection or turn off their device at any time. There are also specialized proxies, such as Google SERP proxies, which deliver Google search results and nothing else, super proxies, which are services that automatically manage proxy rotation and traffic for you, and many more. You should add all of those to your toolkit and use the most appropriate ones for your project. After a very brief overview, let's look at some practical tips on how to get the most out of your proxies. The best way to keep your proxies healthy and useful is to behave like a real user would. That is, keeping a consistent profile. When you visit a website, it assigns an identifier to you, typically a browser cookie. Now, what do you think would happen if this website received this identifier from Canada and half a second later, the same identifier from Germany? Hmm, right. This bot detection system would ban both IP addresses because so far, people and their computers don't teleport over the Atlantic. A set of identifiers is called a session. And once you get one, you should always use it with the same IP address to look like a real user. 
A practical thing is to pre-build your sessions before the actual scrape by visiting a website from multiple proxy servers and assigning your sessions to those servers. A very practical thing is to have a tool that does that for you automatically, like the session pool of Epify SDK. I mentioned that residential proxies are expensive, and that's because they are generally charged per consumed traffic and not per IP address, like data center proxies. Fortunately, there's a trick to reduce your proxy costs by a significant amount, and that is routing only the important requests through residential proxies. Imagine you needed a residential proxy to load example.com in your browser, but example.com also loads various uninteresting but required assets like JavaScript files, images, ads, tracking tools, and whatnot. Unfortunately, you can only assign one proxy to your browser, so all those requests go through the residential proxy, significantly increasing your cost. What we do is connect the browser to a dummy proxy server of our own and send only the important requests to the residential proxy. Through some trial and error in finding what the important requests are, we're able to reduce our proxy costs by up to 90% and speed up our scrapes, all while staying hard to detect. Even though it may seem that with a large enough proxy pool, you can scrape almost anything, it's no longer the case. Bot detection systems are very sophisticated these days and operate in several layers. They analyze your network requests, ban you if you don't render JavaScript, and collect hundreds of data points about your scraper to find if you're a bot or a real user. In such a case, there's nothing you can do but pull the most powerful and expensive trick in your arsenal, the headless browser. Why do we need a browser? Well, at a very basic level, we need to reliably render JavaScript. Modern web applications are built with tens of thousands of lines of JavaScript, and without it, they don't work at all. This does not mean that from now on, you need to use a browser for everything. You don't. But you need to have it ready in your pocket. An important aspect of using a browser is that it allows you to emulate real user behavior. Without it, some websites just cannot be scraped. The next use case is web automation RPA. To automate human processes and workflows, you need to be able to emulate human actions. Puppeteer was the first mainstream library that gave you full control of a real browser, while also allowing you to run it headless. That is, without needing a display. It uses the DevTools protocol of Chromium and Chrome and allows you to control all features of the browser, even those unaccessible to users, such as the network layer. This is a big upgrade over Selenium, which has a limited feature set. With Puppeteer, you can drag mouse and click like a real user would, intercept network communication, inject your own data, or prevent requests from being sent at all. It is a JavaScript library. There is a community-built Python version, but it's not very popular. Playwright, on the other hand, could also be called how Puppeteer should have been done in the first place. It's built by engineers who left Google and the Puppeteer project and joined Microsoft to build a new, better version of Puppeteer. Its most important feature is that it can control not only Chromium-based browsers, but also Firefox and Safari, giving you a much greater toolkit for scraping almost any website. Good news for Python users is that unlike Puppeteer, it has first-class Python support. If you've never used a headless browser, you should choose Playwright today. But know that it's still far less popular and stable than Puppeteer, so tutorials and examples may be hard to find. Good news is that the interface of Playwright is largely the same as Puppeteer's, so switching from one to the other should not be complicated, and Puppeteer supports Firefox nowadays too. While discussing browsers, we should talk a bit about fingerprinting. A fingerprint is any information that a website can collect about you and later use to identify you again, even when visiting a different website. It's a practice widely used by bot detection software and online advertisement providers. When using plain HTTP requests, the website will collect your IP, user agent, headers, TLS version, and other markers. When using a browser, it will also collect information about your computer, what operating system do you use, how fast do you download and render images, what video and audio hardware you have, what browser extensions do you use, and so on. This is a huge problem from a privacy standpoint, but it also makes scraping more difficult, because even if you change your IP via a proxy server, 
The website still sees you as the same user and will act accordingly. How to combat this? You need the browser library powerful enough to let you emulate the fingerprints of real browsers running on real computers and pair those fingerprints with your user sessions. Remember session pool? The default settings sadly won't get you far. Okay, I would like to shortly mention a new tool which got published only a few months ago. Its name is Secret Agent and it's a browser manipulation library that focuses on being undetectable. Or, in other words, having the right fingerprints to pass any bot check. It's still in early stages of development and does not provide comprehensive features as Puppeteer and Playwright do. On the other hand, it might help you in cases where avoiding bot detection is paramount, such as web automation and RPA projects. So far, we've covered all the tools you can use to create reliable and scalable scrapers or web automation robots. In this last section of the presentation, I would like to give you some ideas on how to use those tools to build performant and cost-effective solutions. API scraping is probably the most effective way of extracting data from a website. Most websites use public APIs, so all you need to do is open your dev tools, look into the network tab, and do a little detective work to understand how the website's front end gets its data. Once you find the data you need, it's often easy to reconstruct the requests and never parse HTML again. Some websites require you to have a session before allowing you to access the data. You can use Headless Browser to create the session and then proceed to access the API. When the session expires, just refresh it again with the browser. Scraping APIs is really the best kind of web scraping because reverse engineering APIs is fun, it reduces load on the website itself, and it tends to be really fast and cheap. You should always check for that opportunity when you can. Mobile apps are often purely API driven. This means they don't bother with HTML and get their content exclusively from APIs. This is a great time to use API scraping, but there's a problem. We don't have any dev tools to reverse engineer network communication. Fortunately, there is a way. By installing a custom certificate to your phone and a man in the middle proxy to your computer, you can inspect the mobile's app traffic just as you would inspect it in DevTools. After understanding the communication, you can easily fetch the data. Note that we're getting into a legal gray area here, so make sure to always consult the application terms of use and applicable law before scraping data using this approach. Finally, the last technique which can help you significantly cut the costs and increase the speed of scrapes. We start with a website that uses some bot detection system that requires you to solve a challenge before you can use the website. This is typically some JavaScript that it expects the client to evaluate and, based on the result, it either allows access to the website or prevents it. We start by requesting the website's content using a simple HTTP request. The website responds with HTML that includes the challenge, but no data. Luckily, we have a real browser with a good fingerprint running in the background. We send the challenge to the browser and the browser evaluates it. The problem is, part of the challenge is also sending the result back to the website. But we can't allow that because the website would see the response came over a different network connection, a different socket, and block us. So we use our browser ride library to intercept the response and send it to our HTTP crawler instead. Now we can send it back to the website over the same connection. The website is happy with the result and finally sends us the content we were looking for. Why is this black magic useful? Because more often than not, once you're allowed to enter the website, you can stay there for a while. After a few requests, you'll have to complete the challenge again, but that's okay. Instead of using a browser for 100% of requests, you can use it only for 10%, saving money and making more kinds of projects commercially viable. And that's it. Now, both web scraping beginners and professionals learn something by watching this presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, please let me know in the following QA or send me an email to ondra at Thank you for your time and have fun scraping.